In today's Spectral Sessions breakout session, we are going to be talking about one of my favorite topics of all time, which is data fusion. And we're actually mainly going to be focusing on when you should use data fusion techniques and how in the world is it useful? What are the different kinds of applications for it? And while this is going on, I would love it if you guys have ever used any kind of data fusion, put data sources together for a project, please put it in chat so we can talk about that at the end as well, because there are definitely pros and cons for this kind of technique. So my name is Megan Gallagher, and I'm a solutions engineer here with L3 Harris Geospatial. If you were there at Spectral Sessions, I was the MC for the first day, and I'm very excited to be presenting for you guys today. My background is actually pretty important to this topic, so hopefully you won't mind if I go into it a little bit. I got a Bachelor's of Science in Geophysical Engineering from Colorado School of Mines. And while I was there, I worked on actually a lot more of both the subsurface uh, analysis as well as looking at LIDAR terrain analysis for looking for faults. So both on the surface and below surface analysis, as well as uh, some very entertaining photogrammet photogrammet photogrammetric techniques. From there, my interest in remote sensing soared, and I moved to Boise State University BCal LIDAR lab. Uh, there, I continued with my degree in geophysics and got a master's of science in it. But I mainly focused on the remote sensing side of things, actually, and one of the topics we're going to be looking at today for data fusion of optical imagery. This was using techniques that are commonly used in both uh, remote sensing of the surface and below surface. And the entire reason I went into both of those things was a desire to combine them in the end, to go from sensors in the sky to sensors that look into the ground. Both have their pros and cons. In the ground, there's salt that exists. It's a problem sometimes. And in the sky, there's clouds. They also exist and they're also very helpful, but also a problem. So this topic of data fusion is very near and dear to my heart. And hopefully I uh, will be able to cover some very interesting and useful things. If you've ever used any kind of data fusion before, or maybe you find some things that'll make it useful for a product project in your future. All right, let's go. First off, I've already used the phrase a million times, but what is data fusion? Data fusion is a combination of data. In the case of the spectral sessions and this one in particular, we're mainly talking about imagery data uh, that comes from disparate sources. So different kinds of sensors, different areas, different stations, uh, different overlap, etc. Fusion is the product of these combined sources. There's a lot of different things that this sort of relates to, so I will talk about the ones that are the most common, uh, such as a band stack, having stacks of imagery of different kinds together that can be used for a classification. A really common one that, you know, you might not actually think of it as data fusion is a colorized point cloud. So when you have a LiDAR scan and you also have a camera that's involved with it as well, and you colorize those point cloud pieces as part of it, that is a data fusion technique you're able to have these two separate kinds of information stacked on top of each other. And lastly, a sort of disparate kind of data fusion is using sources together in a process. So this is if you're using one scene or one kind of imagery or sensor to do one thing, but further along in that process, you have to use another one on top of that. That is also a kind of data fusion because it's very important that those different systems can work together. Let's see. So when do I want to use this? There are pretty much three major cases that these can be split into a whole bunch of different directions, but there are three major reasons why you'd want to use data fusion. One is resolution, and I'm talking spatial, spectral, and temporal. Spatially, sometimes we need better resolution than what other sensors are giving us, but we might not need the same kind of scale or time scale or the like. And so we can compare in between them. Spectral is sometimes you really need to pick out specific features, but maybe it only at specific scales. Maybe you need to classify them in different ways. And so that's when you might wanna institute some more spectral information. Lastly, we have temporal. We need a lot more imagery over an area uh, than you would previously. And this is one of the examples we will be going into when comparing optical to optical uh, data fusion. Because we have these things called clouds, as I said, and sometimes they make it so we can't see what's actually happening at a reasonable scale. And so we have to supplement uh, what the other scales are doing. 
The next reason that you might need data fusion is for specific information needed. Uh, once again, I'm going to go to LIDAR for this one. Optical data has an amazing amount of resources, whether multispectral, hyperspectral, you can pull out so many unique things. You can't pull out height, though. So if I need height or topography information, I'm absolutely going to go check if I can get some LIDAR there and add it to my stack to use that for my data analysis. So sensors that add this unique information are also exceptionally useful. And lastly, we're going to talk about modeling. Modeling is sometimes you can throw in so many disparate data sources, depending upon what you're doing. You can have different resolutions for different scaling for things like weather, snowmelt, water, agriculture. You can be looking at different techniques and analysis, like uh, looking at how different areas of topography are affecting different things. And it, it can go insane very quickly. And so these are the major ways that we tend to use data fusion, even if some of them you might not think about it like that. Next up, the necessities. Before I jump into any kind of cool data fusion examples, I'm going to talk about what is absolutely necessary at the like lowest level of necessity. <laughs> One, the data must be geolocated, orthorectified, and registered. It has to be exactly where it's supposed to be, and it should have proper overlap, and this depends upon the project as well, but things should cover the same area. If one goes beyond, that's usually fine. You can cut it down, but you should only be focusing on the smaller area then. Everything has to be where it is supposed to be. Because if it's not, then your data is not going to work. It's not actually going to point out where things are. The next thing is the data, if it's the data must be comparable. Now, this one's true and false. If I'm creating a band stack for classification, my data has to be comparable. The scaling must be close enough to be compared to each other. So if I had an exponentially scaling data set, and then I had a normalized data set between negative one and one or zero and one, that's not going to be good for a classification technique. A lot of them will weight that and scale that really badly, and you'll use one over the other. And so if you have an exponential and a normalized, you might think about having both of them be normalized. I wouldn't suggest having both of them be exponential. <laughs> But in some cases, if you're using disparate data for modeling, then it is okay if there are these different kinds of like scaling because it's already made as part of the system. Lastly, and very importantly, rigorous testing may be necessary to make sure that your data is, well, that it actually works together. There's a lot of things we're gonna be talking about today of things that I've picked up during my process or that other people whose projects I've included in here as well have picked up and known that you might need to test to make sure that one, your data is comparable for the project you're doing, and two, that it's actually necessary. So with that, we are going to now jump into the optical to optical data with this beautiful slide with no pictures on it. <laughs> so one of the most common practices of data fusion is to use different sources of optical data together. And this can be because of temporal, spatial, and spectral resolution, as well as for modeling purposes. So for example, if you have a sensor that was working from 2010 to 2020, and then need a new sensor from 2020 to present, if you're looking to do like a long-term process that's monitoring change over this one area over like 50 years, you need to fuse data and hope it's comparable from one time period to the next to not have to, you know, to keep everything stable and moving forward. Another example is combining sources of different resolutions, such as satellite information to a UAV collect or even ground stations. Now that one's really tricky because a satellite's looking down at the earth, UAV is looking down at the earth, ground stations can be looking out over a system. And so if you're trying to combine those things, it, it becomes a very interesting science project. But those are some examples of that. How to prep the data. This is one of the most important parts of any kind of data fusion. I'm going to be repeating this a lot during today, so sorry if it gets a bit repetitive. It must be, for optical, it must be in reflectance and comparable. It is much better with actual band overlap, and if there isn't any, you may have to mathematically split or combine bands for better matching. What I mean by this is, as we'll see in the next slide, is different sensors have different band widths that they choose for their bands. Red, green, and blue can actually be covering different amounts of areas on the, uh, of wavelength. So you want to make sure that when you're comparing these, they are, in fact, comparable. Uh, sometimes some sensors 
the, the, let's say let's say you're trying to match a hyperspectral to a multispectral. The hyperspectral bands are going to be so much smaller than multispectral. You're going to have to be doing some mathematics there to make them comparable to each other in some way. They, these images must be geolocated correctly. They must be orthorectified. They must be exactly where they're supposed to be. Pixels should line up as best as possible. Lastly, resolution. Resolution is tricky. And once again, it is sort of product dependent. Uh, if they can be put into the same kind of grouping and size, they should be depending upon if that's necessary for the process. So resolution is very important, but also not something I can say like, this is the answer. Rather, it is very much dependent upon what kind of project you're doing. So here is an example of band overlap. This is from uh, the USGS.gov, and it is a lovely chart that I like to use to show this kind of stuff. This is a comparison of Landsat 7 and 8 bands with Sentinel-2 bands. And we're able to see, such as with the red, green, and blue, how they are sort of band width compared to each other, as well as we can go further out into the spectrum and see how things are split, what doesn't exist. And when with this, we can sort of be like, all right, we can compare these kind of bands to each other. This one might be more difficult, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So this is a, they have a whole bunch of these. There's another one that has like, MODIS on it as well, which will be coming up fairly soon. Uh, but coming up as an example, MODIS already exists. <laughs> but this is really useful information when you're starting out and you're trying to compare optical data. So for a follow-up example to this, if you haven't heard about this resource, it's pretty fantastic to poke around with. And this is the Harmonized Sentinel-2 in Landsat. Uh, this is created by NASA. And, or, and I actually have the links and everything on here, so please feel free to check it out. And this is creating a combination product of Landsat and Sentinel-2 data. So we can combine both of their, uh, the, the resolution is at 30 meters because it matches, and it matches the Landsat uh, lower resolution, but you get a better passing period over areas. And for optical data, this is really necessary because we have the issue of, once again, clouds. They're one of the biggest reasons we do optical to optical data fusion. But so yeah, when you'll be getting to the PowerPoint slides after this, please feel free to check out their stuff. It's super cool. This is the kind of process they go through, which should seem fairly similar. So they take the disparate data sources, they atmospherically correct and cloud mask it, they geometrically resample and geographically uh, register it, and then they do BRDF normalization. So that is bi-directional reflection distribute distribution function. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and pretty much these satellites are going over these areas at different times and they're looking at them from different angles. And so the sunlight reflectance response will be different based upon how they're doing that. But because we know where these satellites are, we can sort of normalize that response and make them comparable to each other. Lastly, Sentinel-2 goes through a band pass adjustment because some of the bands are different than the Landsat bands. And then you get your output products. So this is a just overall workflow of how this kind of data fusion is done between these two sensors. We're going to go a bit deep into a secondary example. And this is looking at MODIS to Landsat fusion using a technique called STAR-FM. And I will explain what that is in the next slide. The purpose of this was to look to get daily 30 meter resolution imagery using both Landsat and MODIS combined over a dryland ecosystem for monitoring cheatgrass and shrub brush changes due to fire. If any of you have ever, ever worked in any kind of dryland ecosystem, this is like the quintessential cheatgrass, shrub brush, always, everything is always to do with them. Now, why was data fusion chosen for this? We're going to say once again in an upcoming slide, but dryland ecosystems make it very difficult to separate brown grass from other brown grass. And unless you're using a very good time scale, it's nearly an impossible thing to do. So in this case, data fusion did end up being the kind of technique that we wanted to use. STAR-FM is an algorithm created by NASA Goddard for the combination of Landsat and MODIS to create fusion products between Landsat dates. And here we have a chart of why we can compare these. We have the bands and wavelengths from Landsat 8 and MODIS, and we can see that they have comparable overage areas. So they have coverage in between the two that matches fairly well. We have coverage over the same kind of widths and spectrum and wavelength. So we're able to use this to create these output fusion products. 
How the system works is it uses Landsat, which has a 16 day passing period at either ends of a scale and matches it with modus of those same days. Then using that, it creates an interpolation and it creates a fusion product for the days in between where we have modus, but we do not have Landsat. So for example, this lovely chart here is showing uh, the NDVI response of, of an area we're gonna look at at the end of the modus, the Landsat, so modus in all of the yellow pixels, the Landsat in the orange pixels, and then the output fusion product in that green line. And so what this is, is modus can be very noisy. <laughs> there's a lot of clouds, there's a lot of vegetation, there's some times where the scenes just don't work. And so our modus signal is absolutely going insane. But we're able to see a general trend that matches fairly well with the Landsat data. And then I sort of showed the end results before we actually got into the project, but the green line is showing the fusion project that very well matches those Landsat results, as well as is filling in the blanks using the modus information. So pretty much the entire goal of this is to get Landsat dates or excuse me, modus states with a Landsat scale resolution to fill in some of the blanks we need. So here we have, you know, sort of the overall, why was data fusion used for this? We talked about star FM a little bit, but dry land environments have immediate green ups after rain. And then they spend most of the rest of the year and season ranging in colors of brown and dried out. And that makes it spectrally difficult to separate out these plants. High temporal resolution time series are actually much better able to separate out the different kinds of species that we were working with. So Landsat has a 30 meter pixel size, but a revisit period of 16 days and would miss out on those kind of features that we needed. MODIS has a resolution of 250 to 1000 meters, so we wouldn't actually be able to see uh, the separation between species to any degree, but it has a daily revisit. And so if we look at the charts on the right, we can see spectrally looking at all these different kinds of species. This was during the dry period. They look exactly the same. <laughs> kind of trying to separate those out to any kind of accuracy would have been nearly impossible. However, looking at them temporally, they are fairly similar, but in the spring, we're actually able to see major changes where some species are growing at different types. Some species are a lot lower overall and our bare soil stays pretty static as well. And so we can use this to help delineate our features a little bit more. So what these outputs look like. At the top row, we have our MODIS imagery from April 18th, April 19th, and April 20th. It's a bit of a mess. <laughs> underneath, we have, underneath in the middle, we have our one true Landsat date of April 19th. So this is when they are on the same day, actually fairly close to the same time for coverage over this. This is the Morley Nelson uh, Birds of Prey Park in, near, in Idaho. If you've ever been, it's very lovely. And this is looking at a very small area of it for a test. But around that at the bottom, we have a fusion product for April 18th and April 19th. These are products that are just using the interpolation between the Landsat product on April 19th and the MODIS products. And so these outputs then, are generated so we can actually use that MODIS NDVI track and create, interpolate those uh, other dates. And I said interpolate a lot and create, always check your data, make sure it's actually reasonable, especially when you're doing this kind of thing. So for example, this was a check on an asphalt pixel. There are quite a few more. Uh, you can go yell at the paper if you'd like to. So on the left, we have a chart of NDVI responses by MODIS, Landsat, and the fusion product over a pixel black asphalt. MODIS, once again, it's very noisy. The main reason here though was in the spring was a lot of cloud cover as well as it got agriculture in the pixel because the MODIS pixels are so large that we were able to get it a bit calmer during the later part of the period and it was all dry and black. But overall, we got pretty good coverage and response in between them. And at the top, we have a lovely chart here that shows statistics of the three products over that asphalt pixel over time. Now, what this project was actually about, besides being a cool data fusion project, was looking at the response of cheatgrass and sagebrush after a fire had occurred. So to do this, we had to be able to one, separate out cheatgrass and sagebrush and two, monitor these areas and their growth periods over time. Uh, fires make it so we can't see the ground very well. And then our green up happens usually directly after rain, which is clouds. And so we needed as much data as physically possible to be able to do this. And so here's an example of the Chatton Flat fire that occurred in I think like March or April of 2012, where we have a 10 period, 10 year period 
of before that fire occurred, and then the regrowth of all the different kinds of grass around that area after the fire. The colors on the picture to the right are the number of previous burns that this area has gone through. This was a cheatgrass inundated area. Cheatgrass gets itself set on fire very easily because when it does, it is the first thing to replant and regrow. And so we wanted to see what was happening here. In this case, this was a very interesting one because the regrowth period, as you can see from the chart at the bottom, the, the red line is the fire that occurred, was very slow and quite honestly, very bad. Uh, the black line on there is showing a control that was a cheap grass plot that did not burn during this period of time. And so we we're actually to monitor the growth of this area and the NDVI, excuse me, in this case, and see how that cheap grass was responding to that fire. And so this was done for a whole bunch of different areas. But in this case, in total, data fusion was used to make it so we could see this because we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. So for the ones for optical, we mainly use data fusion to make sure we can see what we need to see to do the science or get the projects done that we need to get done. Next up is optical to LIDAR. Optical and LIDAR are commonly fused for extra information and modeling purposes. Uh, like I said earlier, if you need height information, DEMs, I think I saw something in chat that was a combination of DEM analysis, a fusion of digital elevation models. That looks really cool. Uh, and so, yeah, LIDAR, ortho, ortho photogra photo photogrammetry, et cetera, putting those things together, probably getting better resolutions, drawing more information from it. There's so much that you can do. And honestly, one of the most common fusion techniques is which some sensors sort of automatically do, is colorizing point clouds with built-in cameras. It's a very basic kind of fusion technique, but it's very useful for viewing and classifying in the end. And another common use of LiDAR is to use the output DEM and BSM products to highlight height features for differentiation, which is what we're mainly going to be talking about in this section. How to prep the data. Uh, if you're using optical data, make sure that you use all the normal pre-processing that we talked about previously. LiDAR products should usually be changed to NDEM or NDSM when comparing to optical or other sensors when you're looking at specific features. Um, we want to look solely at the height or the height change rather than the whole product. And make sure your products are orthorectified and aligned. Let's take a quick look at what we really want to be careful of when we're working at with uh, LiDAR for any kind of fuser products. This was an analysis done by some of my coworkers, uh, Zach Norman, Emlyn Hagen, and Thomas Barr for looking at finding these houses and using this using LiDAR and deep learning processes. On the left, you'll see a normalized DSM derived from a LiDAR acquisition of summer 2019. And on the right, you'll see a normalized DSM derived from a photogrammetric point cloud of spring 2021. Uh, this point cloud was generated during the orthorectification of corresponding orthophotos. The normalized DSMs were generated using NV LiDAR and are simply a DSM minus a DTM. So we're going to talk about the quality of that DSM of 2021. It, good and bad. Good. It was a spring acquisition, so our trees aren't quite as noticeable as they were in the one on the left in 2019. We have very high resolution as well. The bad, there are some errors if you can see in the housing. Uh, we're missing rooftops and shadowed areas. They're tilted or incomplete roof edges. There are tiling errors. And so there are some major issues with using that photogrammetric technique here to pick out those features. For the 2019 one, good, once again, we have really high resolution and there are no visible errors to our scene. The bad, there's a tree right in the middle. We've got a big old tree with its leaves out because this was a summer acquisition. And if you look at the circles in between the two, you can sort of see some differences. At the top, at the one, so we're gonna say one is top uh, and some other areas too, there's some rooftops that are just not correctly placed. Uh, the tree is still a major problem as always. And just when you're working with LiDAR in comparison to optical, these are things you need to be aware of is what you're trying to collect, when you're trying to collect it, if it's actually comparable and useful there. So this was a really amazing work done, which also relates to a, the project that I'm gonna show here. It's gonna be a sort of short one, but I'm gonna talk about some other applications you can do as well. And this is using optical and LiDAR to extract features such as roads. 
Using optical miter to pretty much extract features together is a really common thing. Uh, agriculture, trees, things of different heights. When you're trying to separate out features that way, it's pretty actually just using that height information there on top of that optical can add an extra layer, extra feature, extra information that we never would have had otherwise. So for example, this is a, a near map imagery that was used here to find roads, classify roads. I helped make the training for this and it was a lot of work. But then instead we can also combine in LIDAR information. So this is information on height, which combined with roads can actually help us delineate them a lot easier and ignore trees, which is a wonderful thing to do. If you can get rid of those trees when you're trying to do this kind of mapping, that is a lot less work and you also don't accidentally classify roofs most of the time. So combining these two sources together gives us better results. Now, if you want to mess with LiDAR too, there are a lot of different resources. I would highly suggest an open topography if you'd like something freely available. Also, most states in the United States and a lot of places worldwide are also creating, um, and I'll get to the question in one second, are, have their own LiDAR maps. And so for the software that was used for the LiDAR and optical fusion, that was actually our NV LiDAR software combined with NV. So we can go through our NV LiDAR software, create the DSM and DM, output those products, create an NDSM, and then use those to stack together with optical data. So thank you. Good question. Thank you for calling me out. I'm talking about all this cool stuff and then I forget to say how it was done. <laughs> so yeah, open topography. And then a lot of states also have their own websites. Sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to find them, but they do exist. And I highly suggest checking those out if you need some base LIDAR information. Now, lastly, uh, I'm going to be talking about optical and SAR. Uh, if you know me, you know I like my synthetic aperture radar. And if you don't, I really like synthetic aperture radar. And so the last part we're going to be talking about is using those two tools together. Uh, synthetic aperture radar, it gives us a reflectance response that is, and it is an active sensor. So it hits the ground and we get a reflectance response there. Thus, similar to LiDAR, it can also see through clouds. And we're able to use this for constant monitoring techniques. So optical, optical can be fused with SAR data to increase temporal and spectral resolution, as well as an increase in extra information that is not available just from optical data. Commonly, this is used for time series monitoring or areas where texture and dielectric response are necessary for separation of features. How to prep this data? Optical, once again, normal pre-processing. I see, and finally, SAR is here. Yes. <laughs> Optical, normal pre-processing, reflectance, and orthorectification are absolutely necessary, especially because geolocation orthorectification related to SAR are one of the most amazing and necessary steps. SAR pre-processing is for whatever product you need. It does depend upon the product output. So if you just want SAR reflectance, you will have to go through those pre-processing steps. Uh, if you're generating a DEM or a change map, that's actually a different kind of process as well. And if you want to get to know what those are, feel free to ping me afterwards at any point in time, I can talk about SAR forever. SAR outputs should usually be put in a linear scale. At the beginning of the talk, remember when I was talking about exponential sometimes being a problem? Um, this is the problem because SAR outputs can a lot of the times be at a decibel scale, which is exponential. Now, this is an interesting thing because sometimes decibel scaling is actually better to pull out specific features. When we're working with agriculture, a lot of the time we do actually stay in decibel. But if I'm creating a band stack between optical and SAR to look at agriculture, then I want to be in linear so I can make sure that they are scaled the same. Ooh, and it looks like there's an amazing thing in chat for all these different LiDAR resources. Thank you for that. That's amazing. So when you're choosing your stuff, if you're keeping your SAR separate from your optical, you might be able to keep it in DV. But if you're stacking them on top of each other, then you should switch it to linear. Are you using magnitude and phase information for optical and SAR? It depends upon the project. Uh, sometimes I will only use the magnitude information and sometimes I will use an output product. So like, let's say I'm creating a displacement map, then that's using both. I don't like using the starting product products uh, of the, like the SLC. I like to make sure that they're processed and ready to go. So it, it depends upon what I'm doing at that point in time. Most of the time when I'm combining optical and SAR though, I'm using it for classification techniques, but we'll see another cool example after this one. So this is a very scary, but I, trust me, it's actually not. I like to call it my Franken model. 
And this is an automatic batch processing in Envy using Envy and Sarscape to get an output that is a total band stack of my SAR and my uh, optical data. This uses Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data. And so they're very well uh, stacked and resolution-wise, they can be stacked pretty well compared to each other. The area in the blue highlight is the area that is optical data. So that is all pre-processing for Sentinel-2 in this case. And that is a bit of a mess because Sentinel-2 has three different resolutions that it commonly comes in, 10, 20, and 60 meters, depending upon the bands. So all those have to be split cut down and then restacked on top of each other. The area in red at top is a normal pre-processing chain for SAR data. And this is from importing, multi-looking, despeckling, and putting it where it's supposed to be on the Earth's surface. Then we scale it linearly, if it hasn't been scaled linearly already. And in purple, we stack those on top of each other. An example of an output product created by this is on the right, we have the Skinny Atlas Lake in New York, where red is red, green is green, and then blue is one of our SAR responses, which is a VV response and wave. So we're able to use this in this case then to very well separate out things that are agriculture from things that are trees. And there's a lot of other uses as well. So we're gonna go into a very fun example just to show why you might want to use SAR and optical together and actually related to one of the first things I ever did with SAR and optical. This was created by Jason Wolf here at L3 Harris, and it is a classification comparison of Burning Man using Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. So here we have a, some lovely pictures of Burning Man. This is always a very interesting place to study because it goes from a flat and barren desert to a hive of activity with uh, trucks and art and tents and structures and things that weren't there before. So if you ever need a good test to see if an algorithm's working, I highly suggest using Burning Man. So here is a very simple, very simple classification of how it works. We're going to throw in some training data on our, so creating some training areas on our ROIs on our Sentinel-1 data. Uh, and then we're going to use that to run a classification. One moment. And so in this case, we're just using minimum distance, one of the most basic classification that exists. Oopsie, spoilers. <laughs> and so we're going to throw those together. And look at our output. It's not fantastic. It's OK, but it could be a lot better. Looking at our confusion matrix, we can see we have an overall accuracy of about 78%. And looking at our actual accuracies, we can see there's a lot of confusion between sand, disturbed earth, and structures. So we're having some issues delineating those features compared to each other. So let's throw in some other information and see if that can help figure out these features. And that's when we're throwing in some Sentinel-1 uh, data, reflectance data. And so this one actually used both the VH and VV and was thrown into that lovely model that I showed at the beginning, my Franken model. And so then we run that through that classification a second time using the same, this was taken from the same dates because we have a very good passing period over that with Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. And we run it through the same kind of system again. Now our overall accuracy is about 95.6778%. We have a lot less confusion between structure and other features. And we're actually able to get a much better delineation of those structures. So just having that extra data set there with our high reflectance caused by having these urban features caused by a SAR phenomenon called double bounce, where we hit a flat surface and then another flat surface and our signal response is very, very bright, we're able to get a much higher accuracy in our classification. And you can also see it looks a lot better. It's still a bit blotchy. That has to do with the resolution, but it's pretty cool. Oh, on to a really, really fantastic, much more in-depth uh, overview as well. This is a project that was done by our friends at SARMAP. They create SARScape, which is the project, which is the product that was used for this and was first presented by Paolo Pasquale. So one of the times that, another time that we commonly use SAR data is in areas where optical data can't get enough information. We're back to clouds. So our data can see through clouds and show us what's happening on the Earth's surface, even when optical data can't. So if we use these together in tandem or together in a sort of model format, we can use these to get the information that we need. So a common reason to combine optical and SAR 
is to get information from areas where opticals cannot receive any, such as when an area is covered in clouds. And this is commonly the case in the Amazon, and this makes it very difficult for us to monitor things such as illegal deforestation. A lot of the year is rainy, the rest of the year is cloudy, and because of that, a lot of the illegal deforestation is purposely done in times where we are unable to see it with optical data. However, with SAR, we can get a little bit beyond that, and using optical and SAR together helps us make some amazing processes and results. Here is a picture of sort of a cycle or coverage of Sentinel-1 over this region. And we can see we have fairly good coverage over just large areas of the Amazon to focus in on and make sure that we're constantly monitoring. This used to be a bit of an issue, but the coverage has been increased lately. And so it's, we get some very good responses here. Here is a Sentinel-1 full coverage change over the Amazon. Uh, we have those areas in pink, or our coefficient of variation is the highest. So these are areas where major changes have occurred. And those are the ones that we'll be focusing on. However, there's a lot of major changes that have occurred. How do we separate out what's illegal deforestation from what's agriculture or construction or flooding that happens during the spring? Like, how are we able to separate those out? And that's when we're going to go a bit more into time series analysis and using that optical data. So here we have a picture that is comparing a Sentinel-2 image from August of 2016 to a Sentinel-2 image of August of 2017, and then a Sentinel-1 change image in between uh, 2016 and 2017, where we're able to see this area on the bottom that used to be forested, that was deforested, I can't say illegal or not in this case, and we're able to see that in that pink highlight between the areas that occurs in the SAR image change. Now, if we look at the changes in between these, we can look at that area that was deforested and the area that was already, as you can tell sort of from the, the ground coverage, deforested as well. For the green pixel, we can track its change over time and just sort of monitor how it is changing there in our SAR analysis plot, as well as for the brown pixel. And so we really need to find a way to separate out what was once trees and what is other kinds of change. And here is another lovely comparison. And so we have our Sentinel-1 change image on the left, our Sentinel-2 image on in the middle, which is already showing the clouds that are causing us problems. And then on the right, we have an NDVI image. And this one is going to be used to separate out agriculture from forest. So when we're starting this process, we can remove all the agriculture that already exists and only focus on the changes that are caused by deforestation itself. So SARMAP so then did this, where they were able to separate out the non-forest from NDVI and actually fill out those areas that were deforestation in those areas where people just needed more land for agriculture. So they, they get rid of the forest to get more fields, to grow more crops and or other places in different regions, but that was one of the main, region, main reasons for this place in particular. And so using that change in NDVI from optical, we're able to separate those out. And here's another example of that, where we have our SAR deforestation and then also our NDVI deforestation as well and then a comparison to the Sentinel-2 data. So this process isn't, it is a data fusion process, absolutely. We're taking these two different products and making an output usable with them. So we're using that optical data NDVI to remove a lot of mess that is occurring to make it actually viable for us to do this process and then using the SAR data in response to that. So this is much more similar to a modeling practice. Let's see. And then I actually have a question in here. I'd like to better understand what you're calling fusion and envy. My understanding is that data from disparate sources are pre-processed to create maps of variables, which are then used as inputs to a classification in envy. Is that a reasonable summary? That is for one. I like to think of data fusion, I said in the beginning, sort of three different things. One is absolutely that, band stacking classification. One is for models or it's pretty much two. One is for classification, one is just for overlaying, and then one is for the use in models. Because even if they're used in different steps, this imagery has to be used together. And if you've ever used any kind of one of those crazy models out there that uses a lot of disparate sources, the data still has to be used and prepped in different ways. So for example, for this, this one with SARMAP, we might not be stacking these images on top of each other, though we can for classification if we'd like. We're using them to inform each other. And as such, that information has to be comparable back and forth. So uh, 
hopefully that's a better uh, an answer for that question. And lastly, we have here some just the Sentinel-1 dates of change that were created by this project, where we're able to see with time series the actual changes that were occurring back and forth for deforestation in this area. Whew. All right, I've gone through a lot, and we've also some really good things in chat. Oopsie. So just for some end points here, and then I'd love to talk with chat a bit more about some of the stuff we talked about, uh, what we went over, when and how to use data fusion. We went over a lot of the different examples of different kinds of use cases. Always make sure your data is pre-processed and overlaps correctly, uh, be it spectral, temporal, or especially spatial. And make sure the data can viably work together and then it's not too disparate. And this is the main way to test that is through mainly testing. And finally, one of the most important things about when you're using data fusion is make sure it's necessary for your process. When you're entering the realm of data fusion, you might be entering the realm of a very large amount of storage and a lot of processing and time done. So you need to make sure that the process that you're doing needs that unique information. And a lot of the time it does. But in some cases, you might be able to get by with just using one source altogether. Now, I, I love data fusion, but I also love it when things don't take 20 years to process. So that's just a little bit of a warning in there. This is all amazing and cool stuff you should make sure it's actually necessary. <laughs> and with that, I would like to open it up to questions. It's not only questions, but we've been getting a lot of amazing, amazing resources in chat. Um, so I'm gonna you know, feel free to inundate me with questions. I'll do my best to answer them to my ability and also take a look at all the stuff that people have been putting in here because it's, it's sort of been peeing on the side and have been paying as much attention as I'd like, but some of the stuff looks really cool. Yeah, I will now leave it open to questions on any of that or anything else that you'd like to ask about this. <laughs> no problem. Let's see. Machine learning techniques. Random forest is actually really good for uh, classifying too. I mean, I like random forest as a technique overall. And so that, because that picks out the features that are the most important for like classifying a feature, it's also really good when you're doing it with combinations. How do you think hyperspectral imaging will change data fusion opportunities? Oh man, I cannot wait. Um, so hyperspectral, once again, it picks out such unique bands and features that most of the time when I use hyperspectral, I only use hyperspectral. And most of the time there's too many features. So you use things like PCA to make it manageable. But if you're looking for really specific things like let's say you actually have some decent hyperspectral coverage like we're about to see over that dryland ecosystem, figuring out those different kinds of species and combining that with maybe different sensors for better timing or even adding in height features for separating out shrub brush from grass. I, I always go back to shrub brush, I'm sorry. That would be amazing because you can be so much more particular about what bands you're using and then you can highlight those features a lot easier. You can pretty much think of anything that you can do with multispectral, you might be able to do with those hyperspectral features as well, depending on timing and resolution. And you might be able to have a much better, you know, picking out the different kinds of pieces. Because when we're working with multispectral optical data, depending upon that resolution of both the spectral and spatial, that really is like, can you get trees? Can you get an agricultural field? To get down below that, then it can be a little bit more difficult because we don't have the bands for it. But with the data, like with the hyperspectral data, we will be able to do that. And then we can flood that in with the LIDAR data for height information. Like, I'm very much looking forward to it, especially with some of the, even if I think a lot of the sensors are a little bit lower resolution, maybe like 30 meters, we call that low resolution now. Can you believe it? Um, we're still going to be able to get some pretty good information from it. Let's see. Nearest neighbors. And someone asked for thermal IR and hyperspectral. I haven't worked with that too much yet, mainly just because of lack of sensors and the kind of projects I use it for. I mean, I've worked with hyperspectral a lot, but for data fusion, once again, you're usually trying to fill in gaps that you don't usually have. And hyperspectral is usually pretty good coverage depending upon the kind of sensor you're using. So unfortunately, I can't really answer your thermal IR question. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
have you fused mobile device SFM with high resolution overhead imagery? All right, I haven't. I knew someone who was working on that and it seemed a bit insane. So I never actually got to see how that got finished. Um, but I know quite a few people are trying to get that to work. So good luck. <laughs> I think it, the resolution issues and how things are viewed was one of the biggest things they ran into. Ooh, pan sharpening. So we have a, a question. Can you tell us about pan sharpening both in general and in Envy? All right, I'm gonna be a little bit spicy with this one. Only use pan sharpening when it is absolutely necessary. So pan sharpening is a technique that uses things such as your red, green, and blue bands, but you also have a pan band from whatever sensor you're doing. And this pan band uses the energy of the red, green, and blue to create a higher resolution band, but it is only grayscale in between those band widths. So from the beginning to the end of the red, green, and blue, for example. So a common technique in remote sensing is to use that pan chromatic band to make our red, green, and blue higher resolution in the end. And as such with all kinds of things, you need to be careful about doing this because if you're doing that, then you might actually lose some of the inherent information in your red, green, and blue bands unless it is an amazing kind of pan sharpening. Now, Envy has a lot of different pan sharpening techniques and they all work out very well, but whenever you're using those kind of things, you need to weigh whether you need your bands to be exactly what they used to be or whether you need that higher resolution. And that's sort of a, a test. You can do it, you can test it, you can see how it compares for classification and the like. Go ahead, I'm not saying don't do it, but just be aware that you could, it's just a fact of using techniques like pan sharpening, image sharpening in general, unless you're doing those really great, I tried doing one of them, those amazingly crazy, intense matrix image pan sharpenings like they were teaching on like the, the Google one, it will change what information you have. And that's something you always need to keep an eye out when you're doing any kind of process. And yeah, there, there are a bunch of different pan sharpening techniques in Envy. If you'd like to take a look, please do. It's pretty fantastic, but that, that is my, my little spicy warning about pan sharpening. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, Christine said it here. As with most things, you need to think about what you're prepared to lose with it. All right. Does Envy have tools for data fusion, such as Landsat and SAR? So we have a lot, and we has a lot of tools. I wouldn't say we have that many that are in like inherently data fusion, except for things like band layer, band stacking. We pretty much give you the opportunity to do that. Not the opportunity. We give you all the tools you need to do whatever you want. So pre-processing done for both Landsat and SAR, you can do it. Uh, band mapping, layer mapping, you can throw those on top of each other as well. If they need to be geolocated, that's all there. So it's not like there's a one-step process for this kind of thing, but rather all of the tools are there available and there's a lot of resources for messing around with that kind of stuff too. All right, I think we're going to start ending it here. I see there are a couple more questions. And we will try to get back to you guys all uh, afterwards, emails and the like. So please feel free to keep doing that. I want to thank you guys all for being here today. Uh, and I look forward, I, know, I hope you guys enjoyed it. looks like there are a bunch of questions and talk and we got a lot of science in there, which is what I'm here for. Uh, next week at the same time, we're going to have another session, another breakout session. Uh, this is going to be done by Austin Coates and it's widening the spectral processing aperture with NMV and open source tools. Now, what he's told me, he sort of kept it a secret, but what he's told me about it is using Envy and open source available tools in combination to get some products that you couldn't get otherwise. So I'm very excited to go to it. I hope you guys are too. And once again, I'd like to just thank you guys all for being here today. <laughs>